Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Appreciate Miss Sherry for singing. Um, if you have talent, we're going to find you. Like the goodness of God is running after you, we're running after you. If you have talent um, like that, so thank you so much for singing and playing. Um, Luke chapter number 15. Um, as Curtis mentioned, I am so excited to um, be able to baptize his grandson and uh, his wife. I got, had a good talk with them the other day, and um, on June 9th, they'll be coming uh, to do that on a Sunday morning. I love doing baptisms. And while the ride is open, by the way, if, uh, if you haven't been baptized, you'd like to talk about that, it's, uh, it's a good thing to do. So um, I really was impressed with their how they explained how they had came to Christ, and uh, that's really all it is about, is just sharing your testimony. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make you any more saved, it just says you are, is what baptism does. So um, it's, if, you don't, if you don't come to Christ before baptism, you're just a, still a wet sinner, is what I say. So you do it in a way to show the world who you're following. So really enjoyed talking with them, I'm excited to, uh, to do that, so... Um, also, thank you, as Jason said, thanks to all the workers, thank Miss Stephanie and all the people that, that worked and helped with the senior banquet. That's a cool tradition to have and uh, something that we want to continue doing, and uh, it's always good. It's such a hectic time just to get families together anymore, so thank you so much for all the work that went into that. Luke chapter 15, you're probably looking at your Bibles funny, thinking, what in the world is he doing on Mother's Day talking about Luke chapter 15? But I um, want to go a, kind of a different route. Uh, Mother's Day, I'm not a good, and I just want to say this, I'm not a good holiday preacher. I'm just not. I never have been really. I, I prefer to just kind of stay in, the, stay in the text and go verse by verse. I feel all nice and safe there going verse by verse. Um, but I just have never been good at uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, those things. And, and the reason is because it's just not a good day for everyone. It's just not. And in many cases, it is a great day. And I certainly don't want to. I don't want to take away from that, but it's often a hard day for people, and I want to be very careful with that because there are some people who maybe they want to be a mother and they can't be um, for whatever the reason that God has not allowed that, or there may be there may be friction or distance in a relationship, and that's always tough too. So there's a host of things, and some people. They don't have biological kids, but they have lots of kids. You know what that is? Some of you are like that. We, some of you here, you have 30, 35 kids. But uh, just like two of them are really yours. But, um, so we kind of pour in because it takes a village. So as we go into this, I want to I wanna kind of speak to um, sometimes there's distance in relationships. And if you haven't felt this, um, you might eventually have this in your life. I hope you don't. But we're going to be talking about the prodigals. Parent. So Luke chapter 15, verse number 11, if you're there, say, I'm there. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that fall to me. He divided unto them his living, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and began to be in want. And he went and journeyed himself and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field and to feed swine. He would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now I want you to notice in verse number 12 for my note takers who like to circle in your Bible. In verse number 12 he says, give me. In verse number 19 he says, make me. He arose and came to his father, but when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, fell and ran, we just sang that, didn't we? And fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, and best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring in his, on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. Title this this morning, The Prodigal's Parent. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the, the focus of this day. And Lord, certainly this day, this day deserves more than a day. We know that. 
We are thankful for our mothers. We're thankful for the godly heritage as we even look around this room, Father, as the pastor of this church. I know this, this, this doesn't go without the moms and the ladies in this room. So I'm thankful, uh, very personally thankful, for the godly heritage that the middle-aged and even the younger, younger teenagers and kids can look up to and say, that's, that's how you do this. And I'm thankful for that. I pray, Lord, you just help me as I speak. Father, I pray if there's, if there's any type of friction in a relationship between parents and kids or parents and grown adults, I pray, Father, that you'll heal those things. Oftentimes, we just don't know who we're preaching to. And I pray, Lord, you'd help me to be careful, help me to be cautious. And above all, help me to be Christ-centered. We love you. We thank you. Have your way in Jesus' name. All God's people said. I often, in counseling situations, will go to what I call my box of expectations. I have a box of expectations, and so do you. You have a box, I have a box, we have boxes of expectations. And with the box of expectations comes, well, what I expect, what I expect to get. Take, for example, if I was to enter into a relationship or you were to enter into a relationship and you, got, you were going to be married and then you were married and you thought, here's what I expect. My expectations are actually put in the box that I kind of look at my family, I look at their family, I look at my parents and their parents, and I think this is actually how this will go. This is how my life will go. This is how, this is how it will all work out. And then, well, you get married or you go into a relationship and you look at the box, you look in the box, and you think, that's not the box I really, I didn't want that box. And you're like, can I get a new box? And you're like, I didn't really want that box. I thought what the, would be in the box would be, this is the same thing with graduates. You know this to be true. Graduates are thinking, here's what life will be like. Here's what it will be like. I'll go to college. Everything will be great. It will be wonderful. I'll continue to eat my family, my parents' food. It will be free, and everything will go well. And there will never be, well, those of us who are older, we've looked in the box, haven't we? We know that tough times are coming. We know that difficult times are coming. And with those expectations, and then you say, well, I'll have kids, and it will be great. We'll have little miniature us's. And they'll just be so respectful and loving and caring. They'll just be like the Revelation 21 version of us. But they'll be perfect in every way. That's what they'll be. And I'll be a mom. That's what I'll be. I'll be a dad. And when I'm a dad, a dad, oh, what a, a dad will be great. We'll teach him how to do things. We'll teach him how to weed eat and, and string the weed eater string. And I still can't do that. I struggle with that still. But I don't know if they make it that easy. I don't think there is a weed eater. That's, that's a different sermon. But I'll teach him how to do yard work and do all those different things. And, and then you'll become a mom. And here's what it'll be like. And it'll be, my expectation is we'll just wear matching outfits, right? We'll go to church and we'll have the flowers and things and the, on, our, on our dresses. And we'll sit together and we'll sing and we'll, we'll praise the Lord together. And it'll be great. And, and then they'll have kids. And those kids will sit beside me too. And as I grow older, the pew will get fuller. And then it'll go from one pew to two pews and maybe three pews. And there'll be pew after pew after pew. And it'll be your legacy. And you'll look back and you'll say, look at the legacy that God has built. And the truth is sometimes that happens and we're thankful for it. And other times you think, well, that's not what's in my, that's not what's in my box. So what do you do when what you expected to happen doesn't happen? What if there's actually distance? What if there's friction? What if now, well, weeks have turned, days have turned into weeks, weeks have turned into months, and months have turned into years, and now, Ryan, I don't really speak to them anymore. Well, with expectation can lead to disappointment. Disappointment, see, your expectation was, here's what I thought, and that, disappoint, that expectation leads to disappointment. That disappointment can lead to discouragement. That discouragement can lead to despair, and that despair can lead to depression. Not the clinical kind that you would talk about that certainly needs medicine and, and doctors, but the kind that would say, I expect, because a lot of times I'll talk with people and I'll talk with them about discouragement or despair, and I'll say, let's back this up, let's rewind. What did you expect? What do you expect a broken world to give you? What do you expect a broken world to provide you that would actually bring you constant happiness? Even our forefathers said the pursuit of happiness. They never promised you'd catch it. They said you can chase it, right? And so when you look at this, you would say, well, what was my expectation? My expectation of parenting is it's going to be great. They're going to be wonderful. I'm going to be wonderful, and they're going to have wonderful kids. And it's going to be like a copy machine. God's just going to Xerox them, going to make me, then make another me, then another. And it's going to be great and wonderful. They're going to name their kids after me. It's going to be great and wonderful. And there's going to be this, Thanksgivings are going to be great. Christmas is going to be great. And that usually only happens on social media. 
because everybody goes to the one corner of their house that's clean and takes the picture. Right? Just, you, just me? No. But here's the truth. Parenting, parenting is painful. Parenting is painful. Prodigal means wasteful, and I don't know which is harder, to be one or to love one. Because here's the truth this morning. The truth is, some people listening to this message, you are, the par- you are a prodigal's parent. You are someone, you have someone, maybe an adult child or maybe one who's growing up right now. They really want nothing to do with the thing. The expectation was, they're going to love God. I lo- they're going to love the God I love. And everything's going to be wonderful and grand. And it's going to be a wonderful relationship. But there is friction. And what you got in the box wasn't actually what you thought was in the box. And now you're like, what do I do? The Bible actually speaks to what we can do. Because when it comes to loving a prodigal, it is tough. It's hard. And I submit to you this morning that I do preach this with fear because I submit to you, by God's grace, I have not lived this. And I think you need to know before I preach this, I don't know what this is like. And I struggle with this because even when when I talk with people, even when I was little, I remember going to people's houses and thinking, I wonder what it's like to live here. I would go into my friend's house and I'd be like, I wonder what it's like to wake up here. I wonder what it's like to be in this kitchen. I wonder what it's like to have that dad. I wonder what it's like to have that mom. I wonder what it's like. And I remember being young thinking, I wonder what it's like to be in this area at this time trying to get a sense of what does this person feel. And it's hard for me to stand behind this this sacred desk and say, I know how you feel because I don't. But I can say I know someone who does because we have a father. We have a father who knows exactly what we're going through. So this scene in scripture, one of the the most famous scenes in scripture, I'm going to give you some words. We're going to look at this. There's four words for parents of prodigals that I want to give to you. If you are a mom today and you say, Ryan, there's friction right now. There's difficulty right now. And I want to say this to those of us who haven't felt this, that it's possible, God forbid, that we would feel this or experience this. And so this sermon's for everybody. So what we find in the prodigal, we find in this that the father, first of all, we look at this, it says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, give me. Give me the portions of good that falleth to me. And he divided them among his living. First word, if you're taking note, if you're a prodigal's parent, I want you to know this. Number one, remain. Remain. Now, what the, fa- what the son is actually asking to the father is basically, there's no way to clean this up. He basically says, hurry up and die. That's what he says. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> That's what he says. Hurry. He basically says, I wish you were dead. So can we go ahead and cash in the life insurance policy that I'm going to get? I mean, he's a great kid, right? Go ahead and cash in the life insurance policy. Now, you imagine this guy, the, 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 the father here, is thinking, this was not what I thought would be in my box at all. And so he's thinking, this is not what I thought. So he says, give me, basically, the portion of goods, and he divided unto them his living. But I want you to notice, number one, to remain. The father doesn't change his own circumstances to make the boy happy. He does not change his place to make the boy happy. Now, the the eyes of the religious leaders listening, the father had acted absolutely out of line and crazy. But the Lord is making a spiritual point for us this morning that God gives people the freedom to choose their course. He remains. He remains. The father doesn't change his own circumstances to make the boy happy. And my goodness, we're in a culture that just, let's just make these kids happy. Let's just make sure they're happy. They will never be 100% happy, right? They never will be. They will never be to a place where you're always going to have to buy another thing, aren't you? You're always going to have to. They'll never be to the place, they'll never come in and say, Mother, Father, I have all I need. Thank you, you're finished. It's never going to happen. They're always going to, they're always going to constantly be just Isaac and Faith were in this weekend. My man, I'm not kidding you, went in my refrigerator. He was there leaving yesterday. Got a cooler out of my cabinet. I had, when I had a cooler there, he's like, hey, I need to like, take some of that, those, those Cokes and things. He loves, I always get him miniature Cokes when he's there. He was in there with a cooler in my refrigerator, loading up. He's a teacher. He's got a job. I assume he doesn't owe someone a lot of money. I don't think the mafia is after him or the government or anything. He's in there filling up his... He's going to be 24 years old. He is still taking my stuff is what I'm saying to you. 
If you think these people are ever going to stop doing that, they are not. Just take it out of your box now. They are constantly going to need to come into your house. I'm thankful that he can. I'm thankful that he will. He left me too, which I don't even really drink them that much anyway. But he came in, and I thought, wait a minute. What's he? And I thought, this is never going to end. You know what's going to happen? God be gracious. They're going, he's going to have a little hymn, isn't he? You guess what's going to happen? They're going to come to my refrigerator, I'm sure, and that's going to take place. But we're, I'm okay with that, but the, the, the picture of the father here is he's not changing his own circumstances because you realize something when you're a parent. You realize something when you're a parent. When it comes to this thing of happiness and making them happy, it's never going to really last. It's never really going to last. It's never going to last because we know that the, the, the don't allow, when we think of this, don't allow a prodigal to ruin your home. Let me say this to those of you with hus- husbands and wives. You were husband and wife before you were a mom and dad. Remember those days? You were husband and wife before you were a mom and dad. And if not careful, you can be just become like the CEOs of businesses and you're just trying to run it. And then what happens is all kinds of things, tragedies. But listen. You cannot allow a prodigal to ruin your home. So the first thing I want you to do if you're a prodigal's parent is to remain. You remain where you're, you remain within your relationship with the church. You remain in your relationship with Christ. There are so many people I've talked to over the course of years. They said to me, well, we can't come to church. Why? Well, because he doesn't like it. Who? My son. Well, it doesn't change you. Right? Well, my daughter doesn't like going. Well, wake them up for school and say, do you like going? Do you want to go? They're going to say, good idea. I think I'll stay here. No, no. While they're in your home, especially while they're growing up, this is not something we negotiate. We remain is what we do. No matter if they want it. Well, but I don't believe in a God. I don't understand why you go there. I don't understand why we had to go. I don't know. There's nothing else we do that to. We don't do that at the ball field. We don't do that at the school. And when it comes to the church, as parents, we remain no matter what. When prodigals leave, when prodigals fight back, when prodigals say, I don't love the God you love, that's fine. And one day you'll get get to be out on your own, and you'll have to buy your own little Cokes, and you'll have to go out and buy your... And you've got to figure this out on your own. Yes, you have, to fun- you have to function in your own faith eventually. But for now, listen, believe me, there's not two people in the world capable of loving you more than your mom and dad. And what they bring you to and they say this is important, just trust them. It's important. Amen? And so you remain. If you have a child who's, who's off or you have a child who just says, basically, I want nothing to do with you, don't let that budge you where you are. The, John 15 says, abide in me and, I, and abide in me. If my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. So number one, remain. Number two, refuse. This is interesting because we don't see the the father begging or offering to go with him. Not many days after, he goes to verse 13, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country. He wasted his substance with riotous living. We come to the place where we refuse. If the rebellion calls for the separation, especially in an older child or or an adult son or daughter, If the rebellion calls for separation, sometimes it happens. And of course, I I, believe you, I've never lived this. I don't say this lightly, but we don't see the father begging or offering. You know what? I'll leave here. I'll go with you. Sometimes that's not the most loving thing to do. Sometimes the most loving thing for you to do is to remain and refuse. Sometimes the most rebellion, the most thing for you to do is to say, okay, if you're going to go, here's what's going to, you're going to go. You're going to refuse. And that's what happens. The father doesn't beg him to stay. The father doesn't bring out the ring and the calf and the shoes and say, look at all you got. Why would you leave this? Look at all I've given you. He doesn't care because he's never satisfied. And the world is set up. The world, when you come into this world, you come batteries not included. There's something missing, and what's missing is Christ. And so you're going to constantly try to charge your life with something to try to give you some sort of purpose and meaning, and I'm telling you it's only in Christ and Christ alone. So number one, you remain. Number two, if you're the parent of a, if you're a prodigal's parent, you refuse. You refuse to say, okay, you may go, but I can't. And that's tough, man. 
it's very difficult to say, I'm not going to go this way just because I'm trying to chase you down and make you happy. God has an amazing way of chasing people. God has an amazing way of doing that. And that's the third point is to release. At some point, you turn it over to God. At some point, we have to let God handle it. Because watch what happens. It says, verse 14, When they spent all there arose a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want. Note this in your Bible. Famine always comes away from the Father's house. Verse number 16, He would fain fill his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. Right in your notes, nobody cared. No man gave unto him. So when he had all of his things, he had all of his friends. But eventually he gets to the place where he doesn't have anything. And because he don't have anything, they don't have any friends anymore. So at some point, you have to give your child over to whatever God has for them. The Bible says this, and it says this in Psalms. It says, the way of a transgressor is hard. If you're going to go this route, warn them, here's what might happen. It will never happen to me, because you know why? But You know why you believe that? Because even as a child, even as a teenager, even as a young adult, you have your own box. And you think, here's what I'm going to do when I get out of here. And when I'm 18, I'm telling you, my son's 23. He still needs my food. Be careful. Be careful what bridges you burn. You will always, young person, you will always need mom and dad. Always. Be careful about severing that relationship. Because you're going to need it at some point, at all points, really. I used to tell my kids all the time, good behavior gets reward, and they'll say, bad behavior gets punished. Because I've said it so many times, good behavior gets reward, bad behavior gets punished, and I keep saying that to them because I want them to realize that because there's a big bad world out there that is more than willing to give them the consequences of their decisions. That's why we have to give, while they're little especially, you got to allow them to mess up and fail and then sit down with them and say, now you notice when you did this, the result of that was this. Because the time comes when they're so much older where they say, you know what, you're always saying things, I don't even know why, I don't even know why I'm here. And you're like, well, because you can't pay for your own life, that's why you're here. But so you think, I don't even know why, and, and you get expectations, and then you have a box, and they have a box, and then there's separation. And when there's separation, listen. There are times when you have to get to the place where you say, you know what, if you keep doing that, this is what's going to happen. And even as where, where I work, I watch slow-moving car accidents with lives all week long. I mean, all week long I sit across some people, from families, from parents, from kids, and I'm like, this is not going to end well. I'm telling you, I've seen this movie a hundred times. It's just not going to end well. And so many of them say, yeah, but I know what I want, and I know. And you're like, oh, at some point as a parent, as a mom and dad, and what I'm saying to you is very tough to hear, I'm sure, but at some point you have to trust God with them. Amen? You have to, you have to at least, at some point, you have to believe if God is powerful enough to save you, he's strong enough to save them. And your responsibility is to remain, to refuse, and to release, if necessary, at a certain, now I'm not saying release your six-year-old. Pastor Ryan said, you're on your own, kid. I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> that would not be a good idea. But I'm saying if they're in their late 20s or in their 30s and you are still and they're saying, I can't believe it, you're always, listen. Here's what I found in most cases when I'm my little 10-year-old mind when I would go to people's houses and I would sit there and I would sit in these homes and I would say, well, I wonder what it's like to have him as a dad. I wonder what it's like to have her as a mom. You know many of the conclusions I come to when I sit across from people and especially with moms. The majority of moms, I'm telling you this is true, Notice, young people, they're doing the best they can. They really are. And you wouldn't want the job. You wouldn't want the job in many cases that they've had. Because you look at it and you say, well, they always, every time, I can't believe they, listen, in defense of moms this morning, for the most part, I'm talking a large majority of them have done the very best they can. And I know moms all the way from moms who have strong families and they're just running everywhere and doing everything for their kids all the way to moms over there at Lily's Place who have been addicted to drugs and now they've had a child and they're fighting for two lives. 
And I sit across from moms there that are doing the very best. You wouldn't believe it, but they're doing the best they can. And at some point, that, you got to be okay with that, mom. At some point, you got to take your circumstance and say, man, I wasn't just raising kids. I was raising this person. I was taking care of this. I had this going on and this going on. And you can look back sometimes and say, man, with so much regret. But if you look back, you can say, wait a minute. God was kind to me. God was great. And maybe even the relationship, there's still friction in it. But listen, you, you gave the lessons you needed to give. Sometimes you did the right thing. Many times you did the right thing. So many moms, and there are many, even in this room this morning, you're, maybe you have re, there's friction in relationship or distance in relationship, but be fair to yourself to say with what you had, the hand you had dealt to you, you did all right. And moms don't like to hear that. Well, I could have done better because moms won't accept any type of recognition whatsoever. But as the pastor of the church, I can. some of you, I'm watching you. I'm watching some of the older ones finish strong as the Bible tells us to do. And younger people, you need to look up and say, wow, that's, that's the goal. That's how you do this thing. Don't just look at me and say, that's my example. No, no, no. Look at these ladies around this room and look at these grandmas and moms who are serving Jesus. And even when you don't want to, they're remaining. Even when you don't want to, they're refusing. Even if you don't want to, they are, lastly, receiving. What's happening? Here's what happens when, when, when we we're a prodigal's parent. We know that the, when he came to himself, verse 17, when he came to himself, and he said, How many of my hired servants the fathers have bread enough to spare? I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. So he makes a speech. Verse 19, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me. Remember first in verse number 12, he says, Give me. And in verse number 19, he says, You know what? You're just going to have to make me. I love that the Bible talks about how the, he, he, was made, he, he was made in sinful flesh, that we have to be made into the righteousness of God. And for us to be made righteous, he had to be made sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And, rev, and, and what we have to do is we have to receive. Listen, when genuine repentance takes place, let grace abound. Save your sermons, your speeches, and your stats. Don't give account of birthdays missed or Christmases past. Run to them. If God be gracious and it's been years and they reach out to you, you run. That's what a parent of a prodigal does. The scribes and Pharisees would have expected the father to maintain his honor. That was his job. And refused to see the son. Their teaching would have said the boy would have to sit in the village outside the gate for days in shame and disgrace. He would be expected to tell his son what works he would need to perform and how long he would have to perform those work to earn favor and forgiveness, maybe. But the details of the passage, the father took the son's shame upon himself. He did not have to crawl back slowly. He was immediately forgiven. It was the father who ran and said, put it on his feet, put shoes on his feet, and a robe. The father said, bring forth the best robe. Put, the, him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. It's where he stands. It's the ring that says, signifies who he is. He says, I'm no more worthy. But watch this verse 20, that he rose and came to his father when he was a great way off. When he was a great way off, his father saw him. You still see them, don't you? I don't care if it's been 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. If my kids go to the edge of the earth, I'll be there at the edge of it. They are not getting rid of me. I told them. I told, I told them recently. I'm like, I, I don't care how you feel. I'm going to be there. And they may not want me there sometimes. The time will come. They'll be thirsty. They'll need a Coke. They'll be back. There will always be a time. But I will. I will. And you, you're the same way. Now, there are times when it's like, like I said, there are times when they'll run and they'll go. And you'll have to just wait. You'll just, and it'll be a hard wait and a difficult wait. But we've seen this as we look at this. The details show us the father took the son's shame. His father saw him at compassion, ran and fell on his neck. He covered him. Because there were some onlookers who said, well, he ain't going to take him back, is he? Listen, 
if you're the parent of a prodigal and you're begging God to bring your son or daughter back, please, by all means, let grace abound. Welcome them back. No speeches. Jesus doesn't give I told you so speeches. Jesus welcomes us back. Jesus knew what they were going to do to him. And Judas kissed him, and Jesus said, whatever you're going to do, do it quick, friend. Friend? So welcome them back. Don't give them the speech. I know you've practiced the speech. When I talk to them, here's what I'm going to say, and moms are good at speeches. Right? They're really good. They got the words. Dads are like, ugh. That's, but moms have words, and they have reasons. And do you know what you did to me? And you know how this hurt me? Do you know? Yes, yes. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But let grace abound. That's my prayer for you this morning on Mother's Day. If there's friction or distance in a relationship, is that when they come back, you will run toward them because that's what good family, that's what a good parent does. We run toward them, is what we do. And may God, I pray He grants you that restoration in a relationship. But let me go real fast. Let me say a couple of things because it's easier to talk about really what forgiveness does not mean than to talk about what it does mean. It does not mean approve, it does not mean approving of what someone else did. It does not mean pretending that evil never took place or they didn't hurt you. It does not mean that making excuses for other people's bad behavior. It doesn't mean justifying evil, that, some, that sin somehow make, becomes less sinful. It doesn't mean overlooking abuse by any means. It doesn't mean denying that others hurt you and hurt you repeatedly. It doesn't mean letting others walk over you. It doesn't mean forgetting that wrong was done. It doesn't mean pretending that you were never hurt. It doesn't mean you must restore the relationship as it was before. You you can shatter a glass table. You can put that thing back together in time, but it will never be what it was. Right? In many cases, it won't be. It does not mean that there must be a total reconciliation as if nothing ever happened, because forgiveness takes one, reconciliation takes two. The Bible says you were reconciled to God. Jesus reconciled us to God. You see, it took two sides. And because you and I are messed up sinners, we needed a perfect representative on our side. Jesus stood in our place, and now reconciliation has taken place. It does not mean that all the negative consequences of sin are canceled. But let me say this in closing. Two truths about forgiveness for those who are a prodigal's parent. It is not an optional part of the Christian life. It's not an option. It's automatic. It's not optional. Well, Ryan, I I can't believe they acted the way they... Here's the truth. They got a little bit of you in them. That's what's frustrating about kids, right? What's frustrating is, is you see yourself. And it startles you, don't it? A little bit of, I can't believe they're so, I can't believe they're so hard-headed. You really can't believe they're so hard-headed. I can't believe they, right? I, I was riding with Emma the other day. I was riding with her the other day, doing a little Betty the Bug. Emma, they're going to, the McDonald's workers, the Chick-fil-A workers are stunned when Emma pulls up for her food because they're sure a little kid stole a car, and they're just like, give me the Chick-fil-A. But she's driving down the road, and she's just driving down the road like this. She looks tiny. She looks like a child. People tell me all the time, like, oh, I saw Emma. I can't believe she dri- is she Is she allowed to drive? I promise the state of Ohio said it was okay. But going down the road the other day, she was, get up. She was, the person was in front. She went, get up the road. I was like, what? Get I was like, oh, no. She's heard that from Goldie when driving down the road. Get up the road. And I thought, what? And I, I heard myself. Now, my son is just a better human than, all, than me, for sure. I mean, Emma calls him the golden child. Oh, the golden child's coming in. Because he just never, he just always did the right thing. Now, he's got, he certainly steals food, but that's just a small thing, minor thing in our house. But there are times where I look at it, I'm like, wait a minute, they're, 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 they're partly me. And sometimes we lash out at the thing that that bothers us most about who we are. So we try to fix it in someone else. That's a bad strategy. It's not optional. Number two, we will forgive to the extent we appreciate how much we've been forgiven. 
How much has God forgiven you? Then throw that at your children. Throw that at your children. When you were dead in trespasses and sins, he forgave you. So you throw that at your kids, and that's what we do. It's not optional, so you do need to forgive them. No matter their age, you forgive them. And number two, you forgive them to the extent you appreciate how much you've been forgiven. And here's the end, this quote I love. It's Mark Twain, I believe. He says, forgiveness is the fragrance the violent gives to the heel that has crushed it. Boy, if that doesn't describe a mom, we should just get stepped on. You do, and I'm sorry you do. But on the other side of that, I'm thankful you do. Because you model Jesus more than anything when you are forgiven. So here's my prayer for you who are struggling with relationships. I want to take care, I want to be careful with this, but listen. You receive them when they come back. Because by God's grace, I'm believing with all my heart, they're coming back. And when they do, you treat them just as Jesus has treated you. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. It's a good day today to just a few things, to thank God for the mom you have, to thank him for his kindness and his mercy in your life. They are certainly worth more than we give them credit for. If you're here today and you just are thankful for your mother, it might be a good time to just let her know that. But also if you're here and you say, Ryan, you know what, this, I can tell you for sure that this word, this message, this, these four words are actually, I, I can tell you for certain, these, this is for this heart, this was for me. There's friction, there's distance in a relationship. I don't know that. I don't know if anyone's in that case right now. But I have a hunch maybe there is. Just by uplifted hand, you'd say, Ryan, I just want to ask you to pray for my relationship with my kids, with my grown kids, my young kids, whatever that is. I just need your prayers this morning. Anyone like that at all? God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. You stand strong where you are. You remain, and you receive when they come home. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. Thank you again, Father, for what this day represents, and we're thankful, Lord, for Jesus. Because this morning, Father, whether they, there is a mother here or someone who wants to be a dad or someone who wants to be a teenager, a child, all of us need the same thing. We need the gospel. We need forgiveness that flows from the cross. So, Father, I'm thankful for the cross. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful, Lord, for the forgiveness that we have even right now, Father, that continually flows. I pray, Lord, you would help us, Lord, as parents. Help us, Lord, for those that are in this room that have prodigals that they're parenting. Help them, Lord, to get through these times, these years. Sometimes, Lord, the years can, the days can seem so long and the years are so short. I pray, Father, special prayers for those hands that were raised for whatever the reason. God, restore these relationships for your glory. None of this is too big for you to fix. And I thank you, Lord, for the power that you have. I pray that you'd be willing, Father, to restore these relationships, that you would get the glory. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. Jason.